Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back. It is an absolutely beautiful day here in the Twin Cities. It's about 60 degrees, sunny. It's November 2nd. We're excited. We got a great show. Our first guest, uh, she's running for the St. Paul City Council. Uh, she was a recent uh, city council woman in 2004 to 2008. And with that, I'm going to bring on our guest, uh, Debbie. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's, we were just uh, talking. That's why we got started a little late here. <laughs> but uh, your, your son was actually a hero of mine uh, growing up. I watched him play football at St. Thomas Academy. And then he played football at uh, the University of Wisconsin. So uh, that's, pretty, uh, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, we were pretty blessed. He's a, he's a great athlete. And uh, he went on and did a lot of things. He's now a Minneapolis police sergeant. So he's with the Minneapolis police force. Right, and that's your your history, isn't it, Debbie Montgomery? Your uh, your background is in uh, the St. Paul Police Department. Right. I was the first female hired by the St. Paul Police Department on patrol in 1975, and retired in 2003 as a senior commander. And uh, what what kind of experience did you have being uh, the, being the first woman in that position? Is that something that you knew you were getting into at the time, or no. is it just you? I was just asked. Came natural? I was asked by a mayor. Uh, they they had a court order in 1971 that there were 6% of African Americans in, in the city of St. Paul and there were only four African Americans out of 600 on the police department. So the NAACP filed an injunction and for four years from 201, I mean from uh, 71 to 75 they didn't hire and then in 75 it became a life safety issue. And so then they uh, were going to hire 50 and Judge Miles Lord said 10 of the 50 had to be African American. And so they had did all the testing, and uh, one of the EEO officers for the city said, Debbie, I need you to take the test, if you would, because they don't have any women, neither, and you're the only athlete that I know that could get passed because it was the West Point Military Physical Agility Test, mm -hmm. and they didn't get women into West Point in 1976. Mm -hmm. And so to this day, I am the only woman who competed against men with men's standards and got on the St. Paul Police Department because in 1977 they had a court-ordered females class where they had 10 women, but they had lowered the standards. That's pretty incredible. So that's uh, you, partially at least where your sons got their <laughs> athletic ability was from uh, their mother. And so you're, you're a young woman deciding to enter into the police force. At that time, did people advise you against it or, or were your parents supportive? Uh, well, it was a fluke for me. I, I got in only because I was going to take the tests for these guys to try to show that, you know, it was discriminatory against women. And in that year, they had 2,000 people that signed up for 50 slots. 450 were women. I was the only woman that passed and only eight men did better than I did on the whole composite test. And so I had wrote a letter saying, thank you for the opportunity to take the test, but no thanks, I don't want the job. Because at that time I was a city planner with the city and that was a $10,000 cut in pay if I would went to the police department. And then that Friday, before the academy was gonna start, one of the African-American men dropped out. And so I got called to the mayor's office. He said, Debbie, we need to get this academy started. I need you to go sit in. Because I was on the city payroll so he could have me take a leave from my position to go sit in the academy. So I was only supposed to go in and sit in the academy for a couple of weeks, get the academy started, and then I could come back. Well, after two weeks, I get a call, and he asked me to stay for another two weeks. And at the end of a month, I was doing really well. I was in the top of my academy. I was able to keep up with the men. And um, I said, well, you know, I don't know that I want this job, but there may be a woman that wants it. So I'm going to get through this academy so they don't say that a woman couldn't do the job. And so that was my intent. And then after getting through the 21-week academy, I, um, in the academy, they don't let you put bullets in your gun and you don't do the driving in the squad car with the red lights. And I thought, well, I'm going to do the field training so at least I can say I had bullets in my gun and, and you know, had the red lights and sirens. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed for the FTO program. And at that point, I was going to go back to my job. There had been an election. There was a new mayor. My position was there, but it wasn't funded. So I could go work for free or stay at the police department. So I ended up by default becoming a police officer. And it turns out to probably be one of the best things that could happen to me because I got to travel the world. I teach uh, over at MCTC law enforcement, but mm -hmm. I also teach internationally women in law enforcement. 
and I just came back from South Africa receiving the International Association of Women Police Heritage Award, which is the highest award that they give for mentoring and training women police all over the world. I was nominated by five different countries uh, for the award. Mm. And so you were born and raised in St. Paul. You raised your, your family in St. Paul. And you said you have how many children? I have four children. And did they all went on to? I have three boys and one girl. All three of my boys are law enforcement officers. Okay. My oldest son is a police officer in Prince George County, Maryland. My second oldest uh, son is a police officer in Dallas, Texas. And my uh, youngest son, Mark, is a police officer in the Minneapolis Police Department as a sergeant. And so they're all there. And then my daughter's an investment banker in New York, so I have somebody that might take care of me when I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you have a, any grandchildren? I have 12 grandchildren. Wow. Um, so I've got two girls in New York. I've got two boys in uh, Maryland. I've got uh, four uh, in Texas, and I've got three in, uh, in uh, San Diego. Nice. What a blessing. Yes, they are. So y you retired from the police force, and then you decided that you wanted to get into politics, is that right? Well, my, my community had asked me to run. I retired in uh, August, and my community had asked me to run, and so I ran in November and won. And um, so I started- This was November of? I was 207. Okay. And so I got elected in, in November of 207. I sworn in on January of uh, 208, and I served for four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk a little more about uh, your uh, experience that you had on, on the city council, what you believe your biggest accomplishments were? Well, thank you. I, um, I ran on jobs and economic development opportunities for our youth, the youth and seniors and mixed income housing. And so in the uh, four years I was on the city council, I was able to bring in 1,350 living wage jobs. I was able to bring in 400 mixed income housing units. I was able to get a uh, Jimmy Lee Rec Center, which was a capital on the capital improvement budget, as number one since 1992. I was able to get a $20 million rec center built in 2008, and it has the only city indoor swimming pool, four gyms. I was able to work with the Minnesota Vikings and Stacy Robinson to get the NFL to pay for $20, $200,000 of turf to turf the football and, and baseball fields. So yeah, I, I, I saw that and it, it brought back memories because I used to play on the Jimmy Lee fields playing football in particular and I remember rolling around in the dirt <laughs> there and now there's turf, so yes. I guess uh, moving up in the world, oh, right? Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal facility, like I say, 20 million bucks and uh, so it's just a great opportunity for our kids and we have a lot of arts and crafts rooms for them to interact in. And then I was also able to get 50 units of senior housing, a Cardi Heights built. And so at least I kept my pledge on what the community had asked me to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was very honored to have the privilege to serve my community for those four years. Well, it sounds like you got a lot of things done in, in your, your four years that you were there. Uh, something that caught my ear was the uh, 1,350 jobs. Uh, were these jobs that were able to be retained within your, your district in Ward 1? Yes. Or were these all throughout St. Paul? No, these were just Ward 1. Uh, the new super target that was being built, I had to negotiate with them, uh, and they, when they tore down the old building, they were going to lay off the employees that were there, and a lot of them were Ward 1 residents. So I asked them, could they transfer them to other facilities? And they said, well, we don't normally do that. And I said, well, I, my folks need a, ch a job, a check. And so we were able to get them transferred, and I got Target to pay for their transportation. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, while they were building the new super target, I said, could you hire all 300 new jobs from Ward 1 and, and not advertise outside of the ward? And they agreed to do that. And so if, if anybody remembers, around that whole long area, they had signs that said jobs, 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 with the arrow pointing back to a, 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 a box, you know, a, a trailer, mm -hmm. where they had interpreters in there. Because Ward 1 it consists of 30 different cultures and 27 different languages. Wow. And so I needed them to make sure that they had interpreters because right across the street from the new super target is 1247 uh, St. Anthony, which has got about 3,000 Somalis in it. 
and they were all looking for jobs too. So it was just a great opportunity to employ residents of the city mm -hmm. in living wage jobs and mm -hmm. give them benefits. Mm -hmm. And so that was a good thing. You hear a lot of people who are running for public office or people holding public office, they, they oftentimes talk about jobs and, and economic development. And you know maybe sometimes they don't necessarily deliver on the results. And it sounds like in this case, when you were on the city council, that you worked to actually save a defined number of jobs that impact lives and families and individuals in your district and uh, can you share a little more with me and the audience about how does the process work how do you talk to somebody like target or a company like target or like the nfl or the vikings how do you even begin that process of negotiation so that they're going to take actions that benefit the community and your future voters well it's, it's that's interesting because uh i i remember sitting in my council office and uh, Target, the senior retail guy, uh, came in and he had his lawyer and the got finance guys and they're sitting down, they got all their stuff on the table. And uh, I sat down and I said, listen, one, thank you for building the super Target in our ward, but you need to understand this ward needs a lot of jobs and stuff. And so I need to know what it is that you can do to help me bring jobs in. Mm so that they get benefits and things like that to take mm -hmm. care of for their families. And it's interesting because I'm talking to the real estate guy who knows very little about the human resource side. Mm -hmm. So most of the time I would be asking for things and um, he'd have to go and get on the phone and talk to human resources. And I remember him telling me when they originally were gonna lay off the, some of the employees that they had while they were doing the building, and he, he came back to me one time and said, well, you know, some of my employees, some of the employees have uh, problems. We have some problem employees. So I asked him, I said, don't you have an EAP program? And he's, <laughs> you know, an, um, an employee assistance, I'm sorry, an employee assistance program. And so <laughs> he laughed and he said, well, yeah, and he had to go talk to him. And I said, well, why don't you put him in an, an employee assistance program? so that they can, uh, you know, be, you know, put on a plan mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, help them to develop those skills that you think they're falling short on. So anyway, that's some of the things. But it was interesting because you're trying to deal with people in corporate America that deal with one part of a business and then trying to get them to relate to another part of the business. And I was able to interpret to them the need for this and... He told me, he said, you know, Debbie, you were one of the hardest people I had to negotiate with, but you were doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that we were able to help you. Mm -hmm. So we, they even built a uh, covered walkway to the bus stop for the seniors. My green people wanted it walkable and bikeable. So you will notice that we got trees and, and our, it's not a sea of blacktop. It's actually got barriers in it um, so that you can park. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, you know, attractive. So, I mean, a lot of this, uh, the, the request of the community, I was able to get the community had asked me to get 16 things done, and I was able to get Target to do 13 of the 16, and it actually cost them probably $17 million more because their average super Target is about $20 million, and the one up on uh, University was $37 million. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the one on University, too, is it's that whole area is going through immense change with the construction of the light rail going in. And uh, there was an article in the Pioneer Press uh, last week at some point about some of the businesses that are being impacted on University Avenue in your ward right. um, that are uh, complaining and filing uh, lawsuits against Walsh was a construction company that put in the light rail. It's a Chicago company. And a lot of these older buildings were experiencing uh, cracks in the walls and, and different problems with the foundation. Uh, can you tell a little more ab about this issue? And, and if you're elected, it, it, where can we move forward from this? Well, the, right now they've got lawsuits going uh, because a lot of them, they're, the, the pounding of the uh, jackhammers mm -hmm. These were older buildings, and so mm -hmm. they had cracks in their basement and in their walls. And in particular, there's a block on University between Chatsworth and Milton where there are buildings there that um, have been damaged. And there were buildings along the light rail line and other places too. But these buildings in particular, uh, they approach me even now 
to say that they were looking for resources because their building had been damaged and they told them that there, there was no money and so that's why they filed a lawsuit and they're going through the process and then in the meantime some of the business owners are saying mm -hmm. well now they're saying well we can't give you money because you're behind on your taxes well during the time that the construction was going mm -hmm. on their businesses it went down their right. customers couldn't get there things like that so um, we are referring them to some resources, Billy Mitchell Law Clinic and some of those, so that they can get a tax lawyer to help them go through some of the things that they have to deal with the county mm -hmm. on taxes, mm -hmm. some of the things they have to deal with the city on permits and mm -hmm. building things. So we're, we're trying to refer them to different resources that can help them try to supplement the issues that they have with their lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And um, the, like I say, these are long time businesses, the secondhand shop, sheer beauty shop, there's a church there, um, there's a, a video store and a tattoo parlor. So, I mean, they've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, because uh, I lived, I grew up on Chatsworth and St. Anthony, and okay. so it's just a hop and a jump from where I was when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And how did, because uh, I've been looking into this uh, story more and more since we first uh, talked about it, uh, how was uh, Walsh Construction, the Chicago firm, how was that chosen to be the firm to do the construction of the light rail? Is that something that was com competition for it? or well, was they, it they said it was competition. This is the Metropolitan Council, mm -hmm. you know, because we were wondering why we didn't get a local firm to do it. Uh, but Walsh had experience in building light rail lines, and so they won out. The other thing is they had made an agreement that they were going to get minorities to work on it and mm -hmm. residents from Ward 1. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I hear to this day people say, well, Debbie, we didn't see people out there that look like us or, or things like that. But in the same time, the data says that they met their quota. So, you know, whatever that was, wherever these people were at along that building, um, you know, they, they weren't a lot visible, you know, because they yeah. were half supposed to get women and minorities and things like that. So... Um, there, there were some issues along the way, and like I was telling you earlier, we had a fight, the Preserve Historic Rondo Committee, we had a fight to get the three additional stops because the original plan, they had the light rail stops at Rice Street, at Western, at, I mean at Rice Street, at Dale, at Lexington, and at Snelling, and we put an injunction in to get stops at Western, at Victoria, and at Hamlin. Oh because the stops were a mile apart and there's not another place in the United States that gets the weather we get that has light rail. And so we have an older population and a bunch of younger population, mm -hmm. if you look at the demographics of our ward. And in the wintertime, a mile apart, how are these people gonna get on the light rail? And they were saying, well, the buses were gonna run, but they were gonna, if the light rail was running, the buses to run every seven to 10 minutes, now we're gonna be running every 20 to 30 minutes. And so, you know, it just wasn't compatible with what the needs are because we have the highest bus ridership of any place along the light rail line mm -hmm. in 11 miles. And so this way we were able to get it so that the, they're going to uh, provide service every six blocks. And there was some complaint that they thought the cost of building these three extra stops was going to stop the program. And it wasn't about us trying to stop the program. It was about us trying to make sure people could ride on it. And so that was one of the fights that we had when... Uh, I was on the Preserve Historic Rondo Committee to get that accomplished. So you were able to uh, accomplish those three extra stops that weren't planned in the in the original planning, and you were you basically got them to change the plans, right? To add those three stops. Yeah, the Historic Rondo Preserve Historic Rondo Committee. So there was a lot of neighborhood people that were involved in neighborhood businesses that we went downtown and filed the injunction to mm -hmm. get it done. Mm -hmm. Uh, just going back quickly, too, about the uh, businesses that were affected um, in your particular ward, I read in the uh, article in the Pioneer Press, it said that most of these business owners are only asking for $10,000 because that's they're filing a, a civil lawsuit and that's the maximum that they can ask for. And, and given their limited resources that they have, the, you know, they don't have the money to hire high-powered attorneys and to fight this big uh, corporation. Uh, $10,000 doesn't seem to be that much considering this particular project was almost a billion dollars uh, yeah. to get this thing done. And these handful of business owners are asking uh, Walsh to pay $10,000 uh, in order to pay for some of the damages they've incurred. It seems to me it shouldn't have to matter what the status is of their, their property taxes to get Walsh to be accountable for, for what they're doing. But 
Do you know anything more about the conflict between Walsh and these people? I mean, it sounds like Walsh is just basically denying that they caused any of the damage. Well, there, you know, it was interesting. Originally, we had had a couple of meetings, and uh, we had heard through this funding source that they had that they were these small businesses were going to be able to get some money up to twenty thousand dollars, mm -hmm. um, but it was contingent upon their uh, taxes and their and the amount of damage, mm -hmm. and so. A lot of that, if, when you talk to the small businesses, um, a lot of them don't understand all of it and they don't understand why they're not getting the money. And so they're trying to work through it. And that's why I say we're trying to hook them up with some resources, Billy Mitchell Law School, Hamlin Law School, some of those, mm -hmm. where they can find tax attorneys and, and real estate attorneys that can come and help them try to navigate through some of these issues. Uh, there, a lot of them are small immigrant businesses and, and minority businesses and mm -hmm. women-owned business, businesses, mm -hmm. and they've never had to deal with the big corporations, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, there's other, it's not only a business issue. I mean, there's countless homeowners, even, I know my great aunt was affected. She uh, had a property right across the street from the cathedral, beautiful property. Um, she couldn't keep up with her tax payment. She's 85 years old. And started falling behind and you know it just seems like these big developers they see some of this these pieces of real estate and they take out the human element of it and all they can think of is the newest and biggest building that they can put in in replacement so it's, i hope that's not the case in this but well, as you're well aware we have probably one of the largest foreclosure areas in the city between frogtown and summit university and a lot of them were hit by that mm -hmm. and and as i said earlier uh to you it's, it's a shame, I'm a native Minnesotan, it's a shame that there is an achievement gap in this state. I mean, we used to be number one in education, and now, as a state, back when I was in school, and now the achievement gap between African Americans and whites is the worst in the United States. And the unemployment gap between African Americans and whites is the worst of any state in the nation. You're talking about right, right here in Minnesota. Right here in Minnesota, where we're the land of Humphrey and you mm -hmm. know, and and you know, progressive and and things like that. And then we've been for a long time the largest gap it, with the incarceration rate in between African Americans and whites. And now the immigrant it, it isn't just limited to the African Americans because now the other minorities are having increases in some of those areas too. So, you know, we've got to get people jobs. We've got to be able to stabilize families, mm -hmm. families so we can get them into housing and then be able to take care of those, their families with good paying jobs and benefits and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I just think there's so many resources in this state. I mean, we're known for health care in this state and look at how many people are uninsured. So we've got to get folks in, employed, got to get them coverage and get them up on their feet so they can become good, you know, citizens mm -hmm. And, and productive citizens to pay back into the community. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've contributed and donated a lot of your time and, and energy in doing so up until now in your, in your career. And in order to do more, to get elected, you know, I, I think we should know a little more about your campaign. Uh, you were telling me about you're doing some door knocking today. <laughs> Can you hand me your piece of literature over here? So you were going out there just on, <laughs> talking to your neighbors and getting them to rile up. Are, are people excited about the election that's uh, going to be occurring this coming Tuesday? Well, this or? is going to be a low turnout because it's an off-year election. The only, per the only thing on the, on the original um, voting was for mayor and for the school board. And this, we're just filling in two years of a term that our council members stepped down and took another position. So this is all new. So we're, you know, trying to get folks to show up to vote. I mean, there's 21,000 registered voters in Ward 1, and our last election, 3,600 people voted. So we have probably the lowest voter turnout of any ward in the city. So it's our goal to let people know, listen, in order for us to get resources and to let people know that we, we want them to address some of our issues, we need to make sure that they show up to vote and let them know, let their voices be heard. So 30, 36,000 voters in Ward 1 and there were 20... No, 21,000 registered voters. 21,000 registered and voters. And 3,600. And 3,600 voted. Uh, we need to get those numbers up, it, not just in, in your particular ward, uh, throughout the city of St. Paul and, and everywhere. And this is the piece that uh, you're going door to door with. It's a nice piece. I'm 
Noticing some of your endorsements that you have here, John Harrington, uh, Chief of the Metro Police, retired Chief of uh, St. Paul Police, uh, Dan Bostrom, Ward 6 Council Member, Sitting Council Member, uh, Brooke uh, Blakey, Ramsey County Criminal Defense Attorney, is she? And uh, Matt Bostrom as well, Ramsey County Sheriff. And are there any other uh, groups that you're being endorsed by? Or? The St. Paul Police Federation endorsed me, and the Minnesota Women's Political Caucus endorsed me. So I, you know, we've been out there knocking and and trying to engage people, and uh, I've been very blessed. I've uh, had a lot of my friends that have came and uh, you know agreed to, to help us and knock on doors with us. The last two weeks, we've been knocking and dropping and. I always tell them, I said, talk to the people and let them know. We can't just stick it in the, the door. We have to let them know that we have to, we're dependent on them to come out to vote. Mm -hmm. And then how can uh, people get a hold of you if they either want to help your campaign, the volunteer, or uh, donate uh, some of their time or resources? Well, they can email me at debmontgomery at comcast.net, um, or they can call the campaign phone at 651-261-5213. And, uh, you know, any help that they can give us, you know, we got three days, two days left. Uh, so we look forward to any help. Uh, it's a big ward. We go from Summit on the south all the way up to Front on the north. We go over to 35E on the east, all the way over the Snelling. So, you know, we've got Ramsey Hill. It's the most diverse ward economically because you got the richest of the rich on Summit mm -hmm. and the poorest of the poor between the lower north end, Frogtown, and Summit University but it's the most diverse ward in the city. Yeah, you were saying uh, 30 different cultures in Ward 1 and, and 27 different languages that are, are spoken just in a, a little segment of yep. St. Paul. I'm grabbing an interpreter every time I go somewhere. Uh, it's, it's amazing. But uh, I've learned more about world history in these last few years than I did in any history class that I was in. <laughs> Uh, well, Debbie Montgomery, can you just uh, take the last 30 seconds to uh, address the audience and uh, ask, tell them why they should be voting for you on November 5th? Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm coming with 44 years of service to the city of St. Paul. Um, I work for the city. As I started out in Parks and Rec. I'm a city planner by profession, a budget analyst, a grants and aids coordinator, 28 years as a police officer patrolling all the streets of this city four years on the city council. I'm on numerous uh, nonprofit boards and I've been committed to this ward and to this city my whole life. I've raised my family here. They all went to school here. And um, I just want to be able to be a voice for the voiceless and make sure that um, we can be heard downtown. And any support that you can give, I'd appreciate it. And I. I thank you for the opportunity to share this experience with you. Debbie Montgomery, thank you for coming on the show. It's been an honor to get to know you and hear more about uh, your ideas. And, and please send your best to your son, Mark, and, and tell him that uh, Tony loved watching him play football at St. Thomas and, and as a Badger as well. So thank you so much for thank coming you. on the show and thank best so wishes much. with your campaign. Thank you. That's uh, Debbie Montgomery. She's running for the St. Paul City Council in Ward 1. It's a big election coming up on Tuesday, November 5th. And you can see by the link below, that's where you can find out uh, if you're registered. You can register there. You can find out where to vote. And as she stated, we need more and more people in St. Paul, the surrounding areas, White Bear Lake, getting out there and being active. because. Throw the party thing aside, I hear so many complaints, oh, I wish this was better, or our schools were better, or our streets were safer, whatever it might be, you know, really the, the civic responsibility begins with you, and it begins with going out there and making yourself knowledgeable about who's running, about what the issues are, find out what the issues that you care about. You go to the, the Secretary of State website right here, uh, you can see that. Find out where you vote and find uh, some time on Tuesday to get out there and uh, pull the lever for whoever it is that you support. And before we bring on our East Coast uh, correspondent, we're going to uh, line up uh, a pretty remarkable video here. I don't know if anybody out there eats baby carrots. Uh, Leona and I, we do eat baby carrots with hummus and other things. And I've actually wondered, are these baby carrots or are these just part of a, a, some bigger uh, a thing? So, Dallas, if we can line up this video, and I, I did some research on it, and I was just shocked about what I found out about baby carrots. Do you know where baby carrots come from? They aren't simply small or young carrots. 
Let's take a look at how they're made. First, long, thin carrots are harvested and trucked to the processing plant. The carrots are washed and their green tops are removed. Next, the carrots are cut into two-inch pieces. These two-inch pieces are taken to peelers. The peelers rotate, scraping the skins from the carrots. Then the carrots are hand sorted to remove any unwanted pieces. An automatic sorter weighs the baby carrots and sends them to packaging. Then the clean cut and peeled baby carrots are ready to enjoy. Carrots are a great source of vitamin A, which helps eyesight, helps your body fight off infection, and keeps skin and hair healthy. For more information on the produce you eat, visit Producepedia.com. So just, uh, just a little bit of news there about baby carrots before we brought on Sam. And, uh, you know, as we normally do at this time, we're bringing on our East Coast correspondent, Sam Wayne Pierce, to cover a wide range of topics. Something we discuss about often when we're talking about what to bring on the show is we talk about often how crucial of a time we're living in and how important a lot of these events and current events are that are occurring right now. And we like to cover a lot of these topics in great detail, and it, but we're going to change something a little bit. We're going to try to move a little more quicker, talking about the issues, so that way we can focus on a, a whole range of issues and give you the absolute uh, and most current and up-to-date and important uh, news. So with that, uh, we're going to bring on our East Coast correspondent from uh, New York, Sam Pierce. How are you, Sam? Tony, I'm well. How are you? Good, good. I uh, missed you last week. We had uh, took the week off for the show, and uh, it's good to see you again. Are you, are you still happily engaged in making your plans for marriage? I am Tony, and uh, and we we eat baby carrots as well. And I've got to tell you, that was some that was some hard hitting investigative journalism from the Tony Hernandez show on on. I guess carrots versus baby carrots, or the fact that there is no difference. Yeah, I mean, well, in this world that we live in, you know, there's a lot of the modifications of foods and, you know, actually it's been going on for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years uh, about the genetic manipulations and creating new different types of food. So I always thought that baby carrots were just a manipulation to make the, ba the, the carrots smaller. But yeah, my mind was blown when I actually read that baby carrots are just part of a, a bigger carrot. I, I would, Tony, I would, I'm not a doctor, but I would recommend eating as many baby carrots as you want. <laughs> But Sam, there was uh, big news out of the nation's capital this week as President Obama's Secretary for Health and Human Services, Kathleen uh, Sebelius, she went on to testify at a congressional hearing regarding the uh, massive failures of the healthcare.gov uh, website. Did you watch uh, any of these testimonies and, and what did you get from these hearings? Tony, I did watch a lot of the coverage and I, and I read a, a lot as well. Uh, and she apologized, so that was news. But what mattered more to me was, would we learn anything? Would, would we really learn anything specifically from the hearings, or this hearing, that, that matters? And I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little sick of these congressional hearings. Um, not that I don't want answers regarding Benghazi or the IRS or now the failures with the Democrats' uh, health care law and website. And... I do think we need to start calling it the Democrats' uh, health care law, not just Obamacare. Uh, that's probably a topic for a different show. But um, the Republicans uh, bring these people in, and they scold them, and then the Democrats defend them, and it just becomes overtly political. The Democrats accuse the Republicans of being on a witch hunt, and the Republicans make it easy, because rather than, than this week asking her about what they did for, let's say, alpha or beta testing of the software, it just becomes a political circus. So the government now, whether we like it or not, is in the business of, of at least managing this one very important website and program. So we need to take them to task, and the hearing should be worthwhile, and I don't hear that many worthwhile questions. Yeah. As far as what was in the news, Tony, this week, I think the bigger news is that the Obama administration clearly knew a few years ago that the Affordable Care Act, or Democrat Care, uh, would have some pretty severe consequences for millions of Americans. Specifically, they knew early on that, that a lot of these Americans were going to lose private exchange and insurance. And like they always do, they've, they've spun it very well that this is all the insurance company's fault. And I'm curious, Tony, is that fair? Uh, you know, I'm not going to be one to go out there and uh, 
protect or try to defend the insurance companies, but I, I think it is a big leap to try to uh, try to blame the insurance companies for what's going on. I more blame the system and then the system in which these insurance companies have to operate. You know, one thing that conservatives have been calling for over and over again in terms of a health care reform solution is the ability to purchase health insurance across state lines uh, with the idea that uh, free market forces will drive competition and whenever you have healthy competition that's good for the consumer uh, because it actually drives down cost and you look at an example with uh, Minnesota the Minsure for instance if you live in Rochester Minnesota uh, and you want to go on to the health care uh, exchange on Minsure you'll go on there and, and you know how many choices you have if you live in Rochester you have one and the question is, is how is that going to actually decrease the cost of health care or make it more affordable? And the fact of the matter is, with the, the lack of competition, and by only having one choice of a health care company through the exchange, uh, there's going to be no price controls, and you're actually going to see prices continue to go up and up and coverage dropped even further, which is basically uh, what you're seeing right now. And, you know, as you pointed out here in Minnesota, uh, it was uh, written, and I'm finding the article right here, Star Tribune, Kevin Diaz, uh, wrote on October 30th, at least 140,000 Minnesotans will lose their current health policies. These are real people, real families right here in Minnesota, 140,000. He said at least 140,000 Minnesotans who buy health insurance on their own are being notified that their plans will no longer be available under the new federal health care law adding to the national fear over cancel policies that has overtaken the uh, health care debate. So Sam, now that we're debating just what the president knew and when, we're going to continue to see resistance from Republicans, not just on the website, healthcare.gov, but we're going to see it with the entire law, the Affordable Care Act. But a lot of people are saying that Democrats, as loyal as they are, they're going to have President Obama's back no matter what happens with the website or people's coverage. What do you think? Tony, we've, uh, going back to our, our days at, at University of Wisconsin when we were just budding political scientists, we used to talk about which party did, did which things better. And I think one area where the Democrats have really always outdone the Republicans, at least for about five years, uh, is maintaining a united front. We don't see division in the party the way we do with Republicans as the moderates and the old guard like John McCain and Lindsey Graham get into these really public and sometimes bitter debates and disputes with younger elements of the GOP like the Tea Party. Um, so the Democrats have, have put on such a, more, such a united front and it's worked well for them. But now the website and the law both have become so disastrous and, and, and polarizing, they're actually starting to see some division. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia is now leading the cause to author some, some legislation to delay the individual mandate for a year. And he has a lot of support, not surprisingly, from Democrats that are up for re-election next year that can't afford to go home and, and say they didn't support this. Uh, so this is big news, but not just those Democrats that are up for re-election, Tony. Um, you know, Senator Max Baucus, uh, the Democrat from Montana, who helped to author the health law, he's he's retiring next year. He has no election to win, and he said, yeah, we, we need to take a serious look at this. So it'll be really interesting to see where the legislation goes. I'm, I'm betting the Republicans have some pretty serious internal dialogue going on right now. Do they actually steal a page from the Democrats' playbook? and let the Democrats show this division publicly and just let the Democrats do damage to themselves or do they get involved and, and, and fight over the extent of what needs to change right now? I think we'll find out soon and I think that's an area that that is going to dominate headlines in, in weeks to come. So uh, a recent example where we saw some bipartisan uh, support for legislation was the Amash Amendment, you might recall, where some Democrats and Republicans actually agreed. And that was narrowly defeated in the House, but had support from both parties. So this could be similar. And, and if we talk about that Amash Amendment for a second, we, we sort of lose track in the Obamacare disaster of, of, uh, of the NSA and the spying scandal. But 
Uh, news this week was a lot of international players like U.S. allies, France and Germany, were quite upset. Uh, Angela Merkel is one of them who, who uh, didn't like the idea that the U.S. had been spying on her and her, her cell phone. Uh, that's the way I understand it, at least. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, a, pretty, uh, it was a pretty interesting uh, little deal that was made. And I'm going to pull up uh, the article here, if Dallas can show it. Uh, but this was in the uh, New York Times and the, art, the topic was tap on Merkel provides peak at, va at vast spy net. And so you can see Angela Merkel there in 2002. Uh, but essentially what this article is saying that the NSA, the practice uh, that dates way back to the Cold War and has never really ended, is recording conversations and those of leaders in Europe and throughout the entire world. But this article really goes in how the NSA continued to track Mrs. Merkel as she ascended to the top of Germany's political apparatus, uh, basically went into them tapping into her cell phone calls. And it also goes into detail about how long these particular phone conversations are stored for, uh, where they store them, uh, again, how long they do, whether they delete them permanently or put them on a separate base. Another thing that I thought was interesting in this article was that you don't have to be the leader of Germany in order to be targeted by the NSA. It said that they find low-level targets and they'll initiate the same uh, eavesdropping and listening to the conversations as they do in this particular case. And so uh, no matter what the NSA is rumored to be changing, like we know that Angela Merkel is not too happy about the spying. But in other news, though, Sam, that she may be uh, pretty happy with is where Germany ranked in the World's Economic Forum's 2013 report on the global gender gap. Uh, tell us a little more, Sam, about the research that they did on the, on the gender gap. Sure, Tony. Uh, quick question, though. Would it be completely inappropriate for President Obama to call up Angela Merkel and say, you know, you guys did start two world wars. We just we've got to keep an eye on you. <laughs> no, I don't think it would be that inappropriate. And, and, you know, shouldn't it be a given that the United States is going to, we're going to eavesdrop on fellow country people, whether they're allies or not? Isn't that a given in the international scene? One of, one of the things, and I'll get to that uh, gender gap study in just a second, Tony, but uh, what, one of the things that I find so interesting about the NSA when they're spying externally. <laughs> We've talked about how we don't like it so much when, when they're spying on us, American citizens, but the external spying, um, it's been going on, like you said, since the days of the Cold War. And one, one thing that I read this week was a lot of these Europeans that started these practices going back decades, they just don't like that Americans have perfected it and do it better than them now. And that has a lot to do with why <laughs> they're so publicly uh, outraged. But it, it's a it's a dangerous dangerous world, and if this were if this were Syria and the Saudi royal family and the um, the the the, the uh, what's his name the Khamenei the um, the supreme leader of Iran, you know if, if the news was the U.S. has been tracking these people's cell phones, there'd be no outrage. Um, so how do you handle who's your friend, who's your enemy, who do you spy on and who you don't? I think yeah. that's yeah. a really interesting topic. So Yeah, and one last point to that, Sam, too, is that, I mean, if you're, run, uh, if you're holding a public office, if you're a major leader of uh, some major country, or any country for that matter, you essentially operate under the assumption that everything that you say or do is being recorded, don't you? Sure, I, I would assume. Um, so, but there must be, <laughs> you know, there must be private moments with, you know, your cabinet or sure. your, your ministers in, in a European position that you, that you hope the room's not bugged or that your, <laughs> that your lines uh, aren't being traced and followed. So it's a, it'll be interesting to see, do Americans even care about what the Europeans think, or are we just upset because we don't want our government spying on us? So that it'll it'll have to play out, Tony. We'll have to see how that goes. So, mm -hmm. um, so you'd ask. So you said that Chancellor Merkel might be a little happier about the news regarding the global gender gap report study that that came out from the World Economic Forum. 
they started doing this in 2006, and they released the report annually, uh, you know, every year. They've, they've released it since. And you're right, Germany, like most of the northern European countries, specifically the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries, ranks very high. Uh, Iceland, I think, was number one overall. Germany was 14, and, and this is out of, you know, almost 200 countries in the world, so that's very good. The study is important because what it does is it essentially ranks every country as far as what is the gender gap that exists between men and women for opportunity. Um, ultimately, maybe career opportunity and how you can participate in your country's economy, but it starts with things like education. Uh, is there opportunity for everyone, boys and girls, to go to school, to go to, to, to high school, to go on to college, that sort of thing. And there are a lot of criteria that they use, but what's most, and, and it's very exhaustive, but what's most important is in any country, 50% 50, 50 of your pop population is women. So if you're not allowing them to go get educated and participate in society, it's, it's, um, it's just downright stupid. I was trying to come up with a, a, more, a better word for TV, but it, it's just idiocy. So not surprisingly, Middle Eastern countries tend to rank near the bottom of these rankings. I mean, women still can't drive in, in Saudi Arabia, for example. So, um, so it's an interesting study, and, and it's fun to see uh, which parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, allow women to close in on, on that gender gap. But, mm -hmm. Tony, this report gave a lot of insight uh, on a global basis. Closer to home in Minnesota, you didn't have a gender debate this week, but the Chisago County Republicans unfortunately found a way to ignite some racial sensitivities with a Facebook post. What what were they doing and what were they thinking? Yeah, well, we're, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna actually play a little uh, video here to, that the Star Tribune did that I think summarizes everything uh, pretty well. I'm gonna line that up here. Um, but yeah, essentially, it was a Facebook post. I believe it was from the Chisago County Republican Facebook page, or it might be from one of those group pages. Uh, the article by jo Joseph Lindbergh in the Pioneer Press wasn't exactly clear, but essentially this post was made in the name of Chisago County uh, Republicans, and uh, it created a lot of outrage. And uh, we're going to play a little bit of it right now. So Dallas, if you can line that up. Storm over a Facebook post. Chisago County Republican Party posted this on Wednesday. Pro-choice against slavery? Don't buy one. The post has since been taken down, but joining us now is DFL Party Chair Ken Martin. Ken, thanks for joining us via Skype. What is your reaction to this? Well, I find it absolutely uh, morally re reprehensible that a political party would ever use a picture such as the one they did today to try to make a political point. As you know, slavery uh, it was such a uh, painful part of our country's history and one that should never be used in a political manner as uh, the Republicans in Chisago County did today. Uh, it's hurtful, it's racist, it's bigoted, and it never should have happened. They did take this post down eventually. Well, of course they did, after they were caught red-handed using it. Uh, of course, you, you wonder what happens when people never call them out <laughs> on uh, their actions, uh, what, what they would actually do. The only reason they took it down was because people started to object to it. Well, we did reach out to the Republican Party here in Minnesota. We've been unable to get a hold of anyone as far as a video interview, but our political reporter, Rachel Sassenberger, did get a hold of Chris Fields, the Republican Party secretary, and here's what he said. He said he found absolutely nothing offensive about that Facebook post. Field said that as an African-American man, he finds slavery reprehensible, but saw the post as a reminder that the Republican Party started as an abolitionist party at a time when Democrats supported slavery. He went on to tell Rachel, I'm not going to condemn that posting. What is your reaction? Well, it's really interesting because the Republican Party chair, Keith Downey, and other Republicans in the state have already condemned the post. Uh, Republicans around the country, as well as Democrats, are... All right, so we're going to uh, stop right there and uh, bring Sam on. So that did a pretty good job, Sam, of, of summarizing everything that's happening. And that was the uh, Democrat, Minnesota Democrat Party chair. Um, and he was explaining, you know, basically outraged, calling this racist and questioning what Republicans do when they're not being called out. And, you know, I, before I comment on what I, I feel about the, this particular post, I just have to say that Ken Martin, uh, he failed to uh, be as morally outraged when State Representative Ryan Winkler 
uh, made a comment after the Supreme Court ruled on the Voting Rights Act, if you remember that, that, came out, uh, that decision came out earlier this year, that basically said that the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1964, I believe, is no longer applicable to just isolate specific states, and, and they ruled that that part of it was not, I don't know if it, unconstitutional is the right word, but basically that they could no longer do that anymore. And Representative Ryan Winkler tweeted uh, calling uh, Justice Thomas, uh, referencing him as Uncle Thomas, uh, Clarence Thomas being the only African-American uh, Supreme Court justice. Uh, he cited in terms of repealing the Voting Rights Act and uh, Minnesota State Representative Ryan Winkler tweeted and referencing him as Uncle Thomas, which I believe is equally, if not more, reprehensible um, it's got racist uh, uh, undertones to it, and, and it's really a, just a poor overall judgment on Representative Winkler's part. And I think he realizes that, and he went out, and I believe he did apologize for that. But Ken Martin, you didn't hear him saying anything about that specific tweet, and now he, he's all over uh, the Star Tribune and, and other places, you know, talking about how racist this, this particular thing is. So I just wanted to point out the hypocrisy with Ken Martin on this particular issue. But what do you think, Sam? Do you think it was done in poor taste or do you think it's a, the message was misconstrued or do you think this was just an overall racist uh, point that uh, the Chisago County individual was doing? Sam? It was offensive. The picture was offensive. And Tony, I think I... Sam? Tony? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So I, I, I think the picture was offensive. Uh, what I would say, Tony, is that it's, it's equally as stupid yeah. as yeah. offensive. If you look at the picture and you read the caption and you understand that the Democratic Party supported slavery 150 years ago, or even that the Dixiecrats, the, the Southern Democrats of the 1950s and 60s, uh, they didn't want to segregate schools. Uh, so if you understand this history, you kind of see where, where they were going with it. But most people don't. Mm -hmm. So it's really short-sighted of, of this Republican group to put that picture up. Uh, mo most people don't know the history. They don't know what they were getting at. And, and Tony, another thing, it, it's, it's very unfair and a little ridiculous to attack the Democrats because their party supported slavery 150 years ago. Um, I don't think there are any current Democrats that were responsible for those decisions. So, mm. uh, so I, found, I, I just I think it was really poor taste, poor judgment. Um, but it wasn't it. It certainly wasn't the only uh, big news out of Minnesota this week. Um, you have some small businesses. You you alluded to it a, a, earlier in the show in the Twin Cities that are pretty upset about building damages that have taken place following portions of the construction of this central corridor, which I understand is an 11 mile rail line that's going to going to connect downtown Minneapolis to downtown St. Paul. Um, how much of, of this is a big deal in St. Paul? And do you think the business owners have a legitimate gripe? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it's a uh, it, for one, it's a huge deal uh, for those particular business owners that are being affected. These are uh, small business owners who have owned this property, most of them for, for decades. Uh, they're uh, employers, they provide jobs for the area. They've gone through the ringer in terms of uh, having this, this light rail being built. It's been uh, uh, terrible for their business as customers have been diverted to other areas, parking issues, and now they're making the allegations, and they have been for a while, that the jackhammering that took place, and it started uh, uh, next to Marty's secondhand store, but the jackhammering that initially took place was created so many vibrations that these old buildings, their, their walls began to crack. And, um, you know, I don't, haven't done the, the research as to whether or not the jackhammers actually did it. This is what these business owners are alleging. And they have brought suit against uh, Walsh, uh, the Walsh Construction, which is the Chicago-based firm that is building it. And, you know, it sounds like they're just stonewalling them. These business owners are asking for 10 grand. You know, as I pointed out with Debbie Montgomery, this entire construction costed almost a billion dollars. Okay, so this Walsh uh, construction, although they have costs and whatnot, they profited handsomely uh, from this particular deal. Uh, this project costed over a billion dollars. And the fact that Walsh construction can't come in 
and compensate uh, these people for a $10,000 claim I think is done in poor taste. I think uh, that more further action is warranted in this. It sounds like they sent out some representatives to the buildings and took some pictures of the cracks and did a report and sent these business owners a letter that said, sorry, we didn't do it, and that's it. And, uh, and there's something bigger going on here too, I think, with this because uh, these areas now, the, where these old buildings are, you know, these people's businesses that have been there for decades, uh, with the construction of new light rail, all these property values are going to go up. And so if they can find ways to tear down, get rid of the old businesses so that they can build more multi-unit, mixed-use properties, big apartment complexes, things that are going to generate the type of revenues that you know people are already salivating over, uh, I just hope that that isn't the underlying motive uh, for the powers that be, for the people that make decisions that impact these businesses. I just hope it's not the case, you know, and I hope that justice is served for these business owners. And, and regardless, I, I, I just feel that they should get compensated uh, for um, their buildings being damaged, if that was the case, and then also for the inconvenience that these businesses have had since the construction of this light rail has taken place. So uh, we'll, just have to, uh, we'll just have to see, uh, you know, where this all goes. Um, but Sam, on a more lighthearted note here in Minnesota, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the NBA or not, but the Timberwolves season started on Wednesday night. And you know, I'm not much of a, a NBA basketball fan, but I know that you are. Uh, do Minnesota basketball fans, do we have anything to be excited about this year? Tony, the, the good news, yeah, I say yes. The good news is they won their opener on Wednesday night, and then they beat Oklahoma City and Kevin Durant uh, last night. Uh, Oklahoma City is very good. So Minnesota's 2-0, and and 2-0 and is always acceptable, wow. especially since the Timberwolves finished dead last in the NBA's Northwest Division last year. Tony, with the Timberwolves, the better news, other than 2-0, and is probably the fact that after last season, they finally parted ways with general manager David Kahn. He had been there for many years. He was the genius, and I'm being sarcastic, who drafted three point, point guards in one first round a few years back. Um, Rubio being the only one that's still there. Uh, they've been a disaster. This is how bad they are, Tony. The NBA, like college basketball, uh, everybody gets into the playoffs. And the Timberwolves haven't been there in a decade. It's been a decade of futility. So a 2-0 and start, new management, I'm all for it. I'm excited. And, Tony, uh, I, w I wanted to say one last thing. Any, any sports that you watch could be a lot better if you order a pizza and it's <laughs> delivered by a drone. Tony, if a drone <laughs> person delivers your pizza, do you have to tip? <laughs> well, yeah, I think you're referencing that story we were talking about. I was doing, um, doing some investigation on new entrepreneurial activities that are occurring, ex specifically in the Bay Area. You know, we had the dot-com boom that produced multi-million dollar businesses and, and millionaires. And a lot of these venture capital firms are, are starting up round two. You know, the ones that brought us Yahoo and Google and Microsoft and Oracle. Uh, Oracle, they're, they're coming with round two because they're stacked with capital. And so one thing they're talking about is, is drones and using drones for commercial uses. And there's a whole article in Bloomberg about uh, how drones are someday going to be used to deliver pizzas. And, you know, and there's companies that are actually in, investing in these particular drones, which they say is going to cost somewhere around $7,500 to get this drone that you can, you know, fly around into a neighborhood and, and land it on somebody's front yard and drop them off a pizza or Chinese food or, or you know, other products and, and goods, which I think is probably coming down the line. But, uh, yeah, that's the brave new world that we're, we're going to be living in. But you know what? I'd rather have drones delivering me pizzas than Hellfire missiles, wouldn't you, Sam? <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> but uh, Sam, we're, uh, we're coming here to the uh, end of our, our time here. I want to thank you for uh, joining us again from New York. And I want to thank all our viewers out there who are watching the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. We replay on our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. And guess what? We have our website coming. It's going to be TonyHernandezShow.com. We can't wait for that. Thank you for tuning in. May God bless you. May God bless America. And bye con Dios. <laughs>